Let's try one more time. Me. Stop the pinging. Everyone got it. All right, and we are going live. Go ahead, Jess. You're on mute, Jessica. What a rookie mistake. OK. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to 2023. Uh, can you even believe it that we're already here? I feel like last year was a complete blur, but here we are ushering in a new year, and we're so happy that you have chosen to join us this morning. My name is Jessica Miller, and I'm the Interim Director of Workforce Strategy with the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. And this is Workforce Wednesday, and what a better way to kick off our year than spending time focusing on data. And if you've ever worked with our team before, you know that we use data to inform pretty much every strategy that we build. So it made perfect sense to us to kick things off with the state of the workforce and invite our expert uh, from our labor market team, Carson, to provide insight into what the story, uh, what story data is telling us and how we can leverage that information to inform the way that we are attracting and retaining talent. Um, if you're new here, thank you so much for joining us. And if you are returning, thank you for joining us again. Our session here will go until 12 p.m., after which we'll segue into the 30-minute unplugged portion of the event where we invite you to turn on your cameras and unmute yourself and ask questions of our panelists as well as our team of workforce strategy consultants verbally or through chat, however you're most comfortable. And I would also like to take a second here to encourage you to fill out the evaluation at the end of our time together. And we'll get that link popped into the chat for you so that you have it a few times throughout our time together today. Um, just as a reminder to let you know that these webinars are recorded and available to you at any time via YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, we'll also post the link on a variety of different sources, but you can always find them on careerforcemn.com website where you will find recordings and resources from this session as well as all of our previous sessions. You'll see on the slide here that we are trying something a little different. Um, we wanted to, sorry, I've got these things popping up in my way. Um, we wanted to get information out to you ahead of time. So, we have a year's worth of sessions here um, for you to be able to register all at once so that you will never have to worry about missing a session again. Um, you can see, hopefully there's topics that are interesting to you, but I just want to also let you know that we recognize that there might be critical topics that pop up and we will be happy to cover those topics in additional breaking news sessions as we go if something pops up. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Our consultants work regionally, which means that each consultant will have a slightly different way that they do their work based on the region and the employers that they're serving. But you can see here on this slide that this gives a great idea or a picture of the work that we do and how we do that work. But want to recognize that we do not do this work alone. It takes um, a network of people to help all of our employers on the state be successful in working through some of the challenges that we're facing today with, with workforce. But automatically, when you work with us, you're connected to a wide network of people, and we are happy to make those connections with you. Finally, we want to learn more about you, and I see names popping into the chat and titles, and that's all super exciting to see. Um, so thank you and continue to introduce yourselves to us and let us know um, how we can serve you or how we can help promote some of the work that you're doing or sharing best practices. So all of that throughout the session, please do add information um, and we will and questions and thoughts as we go and we'll get to that when we're able without further ado, I want to introduce you to Shayla Drake, who will be um, facilitating our conversation today and is serving as our Northeast Strategy Consultants. 
So go ahead, Shayla. Hello, everybody. So for today's topic, we're going to be looking at the current state of the workforce and see where we can still make an impact in our current labor market, kind of looking um, at what that data is telling us. Um, next slide. So um, our agenda for today is we're going to do an overview of the state of the workforce with a labor market update. And Carson Grecki, our labor market analyst for the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, is going to be doing that. And then we're going to move into a panel discussion. Um, our panelists today are going to be Carl Crawford. He's a human rights officer for the city of Duluth. We've got Leanne Littlewolf, um, co-executive director for American Indian Community Housing Organization, otherwise known as ACO. We've got Tim Miles from St. Louis County, Dr. Tim Miles from St. Louis County um, BIPOC leadership team. Um, Sonia Prang, VP HR Services Operations from Insight Plastics. And Catrice O'Neill, Workforce Development Program Director from Brooklyn Park um, and Brooklink, which is a joint partnership um, with BP and Brooklyn Center. Um, and then we have resources and then our unplugged session um, right after that. Um, next slide. So we've got our panelists, um, Carson, um, that I would like to introduce you to. We're going to introduce our panelists and then Carson's going to give our data update and then we'll talk about um, move on to our panel. So Carson Grecki is our regional labor market analyst for Northeast Minnesota. So in his role, he works to disseminate, disseminate and demystify labor market data um, that organizations and businesses, job seekers, and anyone else in Minnesota can use to make well-informed decisions. He lives in the Duluth area with his partner, daughter, and two cats. Um, then we have Carl Crawford. He's a human rights officer for the city of Duluth since 2016. So he serves as their equal opportunity representative. He's responsible for enforcement of policies against discrimination and harassment, for promoting accessible and diverse workforce within the city. And he also serves for the city of Duluth's ADA coordinator, working to increase full accessibility to all city services and programs. So Carl also works with the Duluth Human Rights Commission to promote appreciation for diversity and elimination of bias and hate within um, Duluth to enforce city and state human rights laws. Next slide. We have Leanne Littlewolf, who's co-executive director for ACO, um, American Indian Community Housing Organization. Um, and she's worked there for, um, she has worked for nearly three decades in advocacy, direct services, and community organizational leadership. Um, the American Indi Indian Community Housing Organization is a nonprofit community development organization in Duluth that puts indigenous cultural strategies in action to respond to community challenges and opportunities. Then we have Dr. Timothy Miles, who is a master's level social worker with Child Protective Services and a crisis negotiator with St. Louis County Emergency Response Team. Dr. Miles holds a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and a Master's of Arts in Education um, specialization in family and community services, and a doctorate in community care and counseling traumatology. He exhibits exper experience in working with diverse groups of people and as a member of St. Louis County's BIPOC leadership team. The BIPOC leadership team's goal is to collectively support leadership to promote a sense of belonging and to create inclusive and positive work environment. Next slide. Then we have Sonia. Sonia is the VP for Human Resources and Service Operations for Intech Plastics. She's been there for almost eight years, and prior to that, has had 20 years of human resource experience, with 10 years of that spent in manufacturing. Sonia's participated in several community HR-related organizations and currently is on the board of the Hastings Chamber of Commerce and has served her um, local SHRM chapter board for many years. Um, and then we have Catrice O'Neill from, um, she's a licensed graduate social worker and is currently employed with the city of Brooklyn Park for, as a workforce development program director. She overse oversees shared workforce development programs and initiatives developed in partnership by the cities of Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center, such as Brooklyn, which is a youth employment program dedicated to addressing regional talent and workforce needs through strategy that explicitly supports and invests in youth and people facing barriers to employment. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carson, who's going to give you the state of the workforce, labor market information um, that I'm sure all of you are really eager to hear. Next slide. All right, thank you. Yes, I know that we are on the clock, so I will be succinct and uh, 
my goal today is to kind of set the table so that our panelists um, can really be working from a, a shared um, uh, understanding of where the labor force and labor market are today. Um, a lot of recent news coverage has detailed the tightness of the labor market, uh, how difficult it is uh, to find and hire workers relative uh, to before the pandemic. It is objectively true that there are fewer people looking for work than before the pandemic, yet there are still many people and groups that remain overlooked and underutilized in the workforce. Today, I'm gonna prevent some, uh, present some information uh, that will hopefully provide a shared understanding of where the impacts might still be made by employers and workforce development professionals. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, stay on the previous slide. I jumped ahead. Thank you. Uh, one of my go-to labor market mantras is, as the population goes, so goes the labor force. Um, the labor force is the number of people that are either working or actively looking for work. Um, so I usually begin uh, with this slide showing how our components of population change, which is births, deaths, and migration, have changed from before the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, Minnesota averaged a population increase of about 33,500 per year, about 75% of which could be attributed to the difference between births and deaths, which we call natural increase. The other quarter was from international migration, um, less domestic migration. However, in the first year after the pandemic, we saw a population increase of less than 1,000, or about 3% of what it was, um, of the annual average of what it was before the pandemic and the gap between births and deaths closed. Um, and a, a decrease in international migration paired with a large increase in the number of people leaving for other states has led to negative migration. So you can see that just the demographic shifts uh, have been not in favor of increasing our labor force. Next slide, please. And this is just to kind of emphasize the point that the migration trends are not just Minnesotan. Um, this is uh, nationwide. So this is the nationwide international migration trend uh, leading up to and through the pandemic. Um, you can see that international migration had been declining even before the pandemic. Uh, recent data that aren't shown in this slide have shown us increasing back up to about a million uh, positive in migration internationally, um, but it's going to take a while for that to impact the labor force. Next slide, please. Labor force participation has declined overall since 2019 in the state, um, yet there have been some exceptions, uh, most notably for teenage workers. There is some overlap with those workers uh, with the less than high school degrees that you see there with the plus 0.5%, um, but there is also an increase in participation for those with college degrees. Uh, show this slide to show that while overall there's been a decrease, there have been some notable exceptions. Next slide, please. Employment data can show us a little more detail on how these changes by age are playing out. Young workers really have taken advantage of increased opportunities and rising wages. Uh, the oldest workers have also returned more recently to show an increase in number of jobs as well. You can see those on the ends of the age spectrum here in the chart. But large declines in the prime working age groups mean that we're still down from 2019 employment levels overall. Next slide, please. Most people considered to be out of the labor force do not want to work. That's the vast majority. Uh, they're either retired or, or et cetera. We are more interested in those that are interested uh, in working but are not looking for a number of reasons. And that's what this pie consists of. The estimated number of people in Minnesota that are interested in working but not currently uh, looking is around 100,000 people or about 7% of that total out of the labor force number. That is up from 60,000 people and 5% before the pandemic. So there are factors here that are keeping more people in this kind of gray area uh, where they would work, but there are certain barriers uh, preventing them from, from looking for work. The share of that group citing ill health or disability or other transportation and childcare is up over the last year. Um, so as an example, at last count, Minnesota is estimated to be short about 80,000 childcare slots this type of barrier could ripple through uh, the labor market. Next slide, please. Unemployment uh, claims data are another source of information, information that provide additional detail on who is looking for work. Um, as more young people enter the labor force, the number of unemployment claims by them also rose, plus an increase in eligibility for the youngest workers may explain why that share has risen as well. 
the most overrepresented age groups relative to their presence in the labor force um, are the prime working ages. So 30 to 59, uh, about 1.3 times as many claims as they are represented in the labor force. And then the ratio for older workers is much lower, most likely reflecting the fact that if an older worker is out of the labor force or out of work, they're more likely to exit the labor force uh, altogether. Next slide, please. This is showing uh, UI claims by educational level. Uh, we have seen increases in the share of UI claims for those with the least education, high school or below, but also an increase uh, for the most, uh, those with most education in the last year. When compared to the labor force, high school grads are the most overrepresented in UI claims, about 21.2% of the labor force, but 40% of UI claims this year. And those with bachelors are 40% of the labor force and 17% of claims. So you can see how there's a difference there. Um, and those with some college are about even, 33% of labor force, 35% of claims. And then uh, those with less than high school are 6% of labor force and 8% of claims, so also pretty similar. Next slide, please. The distribution of UI claims uh, by is most is perhaps most uneven by race. Um, while the share and number of claims for white workers is down from pre-pandemic, they are up for all groups of color, most notably Black or African American workers, who represent just under six percent of the labor force, but over twenty-one percent of UI claims. Um, so a pretty big disparity there. Similarly, Indigenous workers account for 0.9 percent of the labor force, but double that in share of UI claims. Um, next slide, please. The labor force uh, participation rate um, shown here for a, a few um, racial and ethnic uh, categories. Uh, over the year, we've seen some positive growth in labor force participation of black workers, uh, while the labor force participation rate for white workers sat flat and declined for Hispanic workers. Um, not shown in this chart, um, for reference, the labor force participation rate for Native American Minnesotans was an average of 57.4 percent between 2017 and 2021. Um, that's from a different data source, so we can't compare it exactly, but that's compared to about 69.2 percent for the overall um, population. The groups with the lowest labor force participation rate are 65 plus workers, those in poverty, those with disabilities, uh, teenage workers, and those with less than a high school degree. Um, all of those um, are 66% or below, and when you talk about 65 plus workers, it's 28%, those in poverty around 50%, um, as with those with disabilities in teens. Um, next slide, please. Even with historically low uh, unemployment rates, uh, there still are disparities by race, um, as the Black and Hispanic rate remain about double that of the white unemployment rate. Over the year, the unemployment rate has declined about 1.5 points overall. Um, the groups with the highest unemployment rates also happen to be some of those with the lowest labor force participation rates. So you can see how those um, tend to work in tandem. Those in poverty uh, at 17.5%, Native Americans at 12.9%, Black or African Americans 8.6%, and teens at 10.7%. Um, and then lastly, those with disability at 10%, all with rates at least double the total average rate for the state. Um, so to sum up, uh, yes, there are fewer job seekers to go around for more job openings. And some of this is due to long-term demographic trends and shifts um, that are difficult to reverse, such as an aging population um, and international migration. However, there are still many groups of workers that if provided a little additional uh, uh, attention or help may uh, be able to overcome the barriers keeping them out of the workforce or keeping them unemployed. I look forward to hearing from uh, our panelists and experts on how they are tackling these important issues. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Carson. So there are a few interesting points from the data that I would like to bring back to the group for discussion. So we can see um, from the data that over half of the individuals on unemployment had some college or higher and um, only the UI shares to decrease was white workers and the share of claims by workers of color is disproportionately high. And lastly, the groups with the highest unemployment rates in Minnesota are those in poverty, Native Americans, African Americans, teens, those with disabilities, um, all over 8.5% compared to the state's current rate of 2.3%. Right. So thinking as an employer, looking for an opportunity to find people, right, looking at this as an opportunity to tap into available candidate pools and helping to move the needle in hiring and retention. Right. So 
trying to say, getting excited about what can we do. Um, this is where I want to like dig in, right? The first thing to do is why might these gaps exist, right? Asking those questions. So um, I want to pose a question to Carl and Leanne. Maybe, you know, how would I want to think about maybe how would we define the difference maybe between equity and equality, maybe specifically in the workforce, because maybe that could maybe be a defining shift as to maybe why some of these reasons exist. Good morning, Shayla. Good morning, panelists. Um, thank you first for allowing me to be a part of this dynamic panel. Um, the difference between equality, obviously, and equity, we've all seen the slides in the past of the people standing over the fence and different people on different crates, right? And equality obviously means that two people receive the same thing, has the same value. Equity, though, is something much different, meaning that those people have what they need to succeed, each individual. And one of the challenges with that fence or that barrier in that slide that we notice is who puts the fence there? Who has the power to remove the fence? So when we start to look at workforce and how we show up, we, we don't have a chance to really look at the mental the microaggressions and some of the other capacities that impact your workforce before they even show up and how those dynamics change a community and change how we see each other and how the world sees us as future employees. And I'll yield there for my other colleague. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, um, good morning. I'm Leanne Little Wolf. I'm the co executive director of ACO. And I always like to start with my traditional introduction. So I'm just going to do that really quick. And so, Gijik, Indigo, Mainga, Nindu Dame, and Zaga Squad, Jimmy Cog, No Unjiba. So I'm a U.S. citizen, but I, I am also a tribal citizen of um, the Anishinaabe Nation, and I'm a band member with Leech Lake. And um, this question around equity and um, equality, I in my opinion, um, equity addresses the reality of, of equality. So if we don't have equal access, then to me, equity is like the way that we address that. We look at the root causes, what are the challenges? So what Carl was talking about, um, we know what some of those challenges have been. And I think equity is, is more around a framework of thinking like problem solving. So how do we help everyone have equal access? Understanding that there's different um, circumstances and scenarios in back historical context. So I think that we need to think in a, a global context, and then we also have to think individually what people are dealing with where they're not having that equal access. Um, I wanted to thank, thank Carson for all of that um, data because just as a, as a community member who thinks about workforce development, I've been looking for data and like for Native American communities specifically, and a lot of times it's really hard to find that data. So it's really, um, I've connected with a lot of different community members saying like, I need, I need, would like to have some owner, home ownership data. Um, what is our unemployment and education? And um, I was connected with Carson and he gave me a, um, some specific information for Duluth in Northeast Minnesota. And I think that when you start to look at that data, you start to understand like where is there inequity where are those disparities and then you can start to kind of isolate okay well i see that there's a lot of graduates but for this population but they're not finishing college they're going into college but they're not finishing college so what's going on there so i, I think like data is a pathway to equality and it gives us a pathway to equity for us to kind of figure out like what do we need to do as a community thank you using data as a driver to help make decisions, right? I mean, it, it helps us make informed decisions to um, move forward, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think my next question would help um, to go to Tim and Catrice. So thinking about kind of those responses about equity, um, what does it mean to demonstrate that in the in the workplace? Or, or where have you seen that being done, the equity being demonstrated in the workplace? Good morning. I don't know which one of us should go first, so I'll just jump in for us, Tim. 
Um, thank you everyone for having me here. Um, you know, I think what it means to demonstrate equity in the workplace, typically what we see is employers or businesses really thinking about equity through the lens of providing fair treatment to employees, access to resources and services, opportunities for advancement, inclusive working environments, and kind of, you know, the list isn't exhaustive, right? We know all of the different ways that we try to take action and demonstrate, but I really believe that in order for us to fully demonstrate equity in the workforce, we really need to be taking the opportunity to understand and acknowledge trauma and systemic barriers first and who has been disproportionately impacted um, and historically impacted in the labor force and workforce. Um, you know, I think a couple of the things that come to mind for me is not just thinking about the workforce and the talent, but also thinking about um, workplace development, right? How are businesses and organizations really breaking barriers and reimagining what their overall organizational goals are and who they want, um, you know, at the decision making tables and how policies are developed. Um, I always kind of think of policy also as a form of violence. And if we're not addressing some of those things, then we're just perpetuating them. So I really think it's valuable and important for us to be taking an opportunity to really understand intentionally and investing in that learning to acknowledge trauma and systemic barriers in the workplace. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm Tim Miles. Um, you know, when I, when I look at um, our county, um, St. Louis County is one of the, you know, geographically, we're the largest county in the state of Minnesota. So we we cover a lot of ground and um, diversity, equity and inclusion looks different across our county. And we serve and we continue to serve um, a growing population of diversity. And, and so I think when you look at that, you know, you have to think about, um, you know, fair treatment. Um, Ad, uh, advancement and the opportunity to advance and what that might look like um, in our history of our county, um, it, our tactics or ways of uh, inviting people to advance um, looks far different now than it, it had in the past. And so um, we're really concerned about meeting the needs of all the people in our county and all the people that we serve and to be able to do that you have to be able to um recognize you know the the population of our county and the change in the population of our county and be able to meet our people where they're at that's something you hear a lot now right meet everyone mm -hmm. where they're at and then um you know, you're only as diverse as the community that you serve, yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I'm going to pose this one to, to Carl and Sonia. So, is equitable access only about race or ethnicity? So, I mean, you guys take that in either order that you want, but um, when we're talking about equi equitable access, is it is it only a race or ethnicity question? Well, I can start, Carol. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I think we all agree that it's much more than that, right? Um, and it can be <clears throat> anything from, you know, your background, um, maybe it's your, you know, family status, things like that. So anything that's a pre-existing barrier that an employee might come to us with, right? And so um, we, you have to look at, you know, that access very broadly, um, which is what what we try to do too. You know, we have a union environment in our manufacturing plant, and um, you know, for the union, everything is about seniority, right? Seniority is key. Um, but as we have these discussions with them and um, meet with them regularly about our workforce, you know, we're really trying to look at a, a broader um, sense of of our employees' um, access to things and. And how we define, you know, like we've talked about and like Carl, you mentioned um, how we define equity um, within, you know, our environment as well and how we can think of other things, um, even within that, you know, union environment, which tends to be um, a little bit inflexible, right? And um, also uh, very defined by the contract, but um, there's so many things that we're doing around diversity and, um, and that, um, 
that access even within those confines. So. Awesome, thank you. Sonia, you said it so eloquently. I agree 100% uh, in what you said, but I also want to go on record, Shayla, that race does matter. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to make sure that that point is, is, so it's not always about race, but race does matter. So um, I'm going to go this one to Leanne and Catrice. Can you give us a brief overview of your program opportunities at your organization or others that highlight promising practices for hiring or training or upskilling for impacted individuals? I guess I'll, I'll go again. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think um, so as a workforce development program director at the city of Brooklyn Park in partnership with Brooklyn Center, I think, you know, we have deployed a variety of different program opportunities ourselves, um, you know, thinking about Brooklink, our youth workforce development program that is supported by DEED and Hennepin County and a variety of other stakeholders, you know, we've really prioritized youth and the future labor force as a strategy for, you um, you know, developing kind of promising practices and highlighting opportunities for recruiting diverse talent into different industries and sectors. Um, you know, I think through the pandemic, one of the things that, you know, we've really been focused a lot on is thinking about both, um, you know, local talent and employers. And so how can we be really focused on the strategies needed to help support local businesses? Um, a couple of the ways that we have done that is launched a couple of pilot programs in 2022. One specifically is our Career Pathways program that prioritized the construction and trades industry with an intersection with public works. Um, at the City of Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center, we actually um, reduced the age of employment for our public works positions to 16 and 17 to help build a better labor force and more diverse labor force um, into public works, which is traditionally an industry that has been predominantly male and white. Um, for pretty much all of its eternity in existence. Um, so, you know, really thinking about that as a stri strategy for um, providing training and internships and employment opportunities in industries that have been um, traditionally not represented by um, diverse communities. Um, another way that we've supported local businesses is really thinking about um, those who have had limited capacity and resources. So um, in partnership with kind of, you know, at the city, we have the good fortune of having a business coordinator as well as our workforce development programs. And so thinking about where the intersections are between those programs and the um, strategies that we have at the city, um, we launched a youth entrepreneurship program that provide provides wage subsidies to small businesses and matches them with a young person um, up to age 24 who are interested in business and entrepreneurship as a career pathway. That strategy supports kind of a dual purpose where you're providing financial resources to a small business that has been significantly impacted through our current climate, um, as well as providing mentorship and employment opportunities um, to local talent. Um, and the other kind of, I think, specifically for us about our program opportunities um, has been the development of a job board that provides um, local businesses in Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center an opportunity to connect directly to diverse talent. The talent who are connected to that job board are exclusively alumni of our workforce development program, so we guarantee that every person who is applying for those positions is also a person of color who has barriers to employment, who has the supports and resources behind them and the team behind them through Brooklink and through our other career pro pathways programs to support their success in the workplace. And we provide case management support and job coaching and individual mentorship to ensure that any person who applies for those positions has what they need to be successful once they land the job. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really great to hear. I, I just want to kind of build off of this idea of having direct connection with the community and then also letting the community know that it's a welcoming space and that they, and being really transparent about here's the supports that are going to be available. Um, I think some of the programming that we, uh, so I work at a, at a nonprofit organization and in our hiring practices, we really do have a, um, 
pay attention to the value of life experiences and we look at that as relevant skill sets. So I think some of this also is like re um, reevaluating our our overall cultural, like our, I would say like our general social cultural hiring practices and really trying to fine tune those and looking at, I think sometimes that we have been programmed to look at um, certain aspects as like these are the highest um, qualities that we want in a candidate. And sometimes life experiences for BIPOC community, they're doing those things, but it's not always getting translated that way. So I, I think that one, as an employer, when you're doing hiring, you have to pay attention to like what those life experiences carry, what value they carry, um, how have they weathered through adversity, how have you know, I know like people who live re low resourced who manage to get to work with, you know, despite 20 different barriers and they do that every day. So how do we how do we value how do we evaluate that different in that belt in that hiring practice? So I think that that's one way that we could take a um, that we can implement immediately with our hiring is how we do it. I think um, as a nonprofit organization, we're trying to look at what are the future jobs and what where are the um income opportunities in the future. So we're looking at healthcare. So we've been building relationships with healthcare employers and it's not a one-time meeting, it's ongoing relationship and it's meeting um, on a continual basis and talking through their workforce development. Um, what opportunities do you have? And like, here's the challenges of our community, here's the strengths of our community. And not if we can't figure it out this first meeting, it's having that tenacity to go forward and to say, like, this is a long game. And what are we going to figure out for the long term future and having those problem solving co conversations and then getting something concrete going. Um, the other area that we're looking at is renewable energy. And so we are working on a solar um, training program. We're going to put cultural design in there. And so I think it's around like really starting to name out some of these elements of like what's different about this training program and why is it effective? And, and really naming it out so others can learn from it and then also try. And the last thing I will say is that there are um, entities who have been doing um, effective programming that engage, you know, BIPOC community and um, community populations who have not been in the way it prefers. And I'd say the first one that comes to my mind is um, Tribal Tero. It's T-E-R-O, Tribal Employment Resource Officers. And, you know, I'm a Leech Lake band member, and so I can sign up at my tarot office. I can get job training through my tarot office in, like, anything. I've seen um, band members get training in wildfire fighting, um, construction, and they follow them through. There's, like, stipends for lodging and transportation and food. And um, they, I know that um, I have family members that went through a, a training program that took years to get in place. They worked with a, a union to get this training open to band members. So I think it's like we should really pay attention to how they have done their work, learn how they did that, and then like learn what their strategies are. And I'd like to see more highlighting of those programs. I think there's a American Indian OIC, which works really effectively with BIPOC community members in the metro area. I'm really curious about what they do and how they do it. And I also know that um, Deed through this our state agency deed funds a number of workforce um, development partners. And it would be great to have those partners highlighted, like how have they been effective and what have been their strategies so that we could all learn together. Absolutely. Thank you, Liam. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, the, we're talking long game, right? Leanne's talking long game. So I'm going to have Carl and Tim talk easy wins, short game, right? What are some easy wins? What are some key advice that you can give to some businesses that they leave today that if they want to start doing some, some work on site, what are some easy wins, some things that they could do right now if they wanted to start doing some of this work to maybe increase and attract and retain um, some of this available talent that we can see by the data that's out there. I can start. So I, I would say that, 
Oh, I can say that there, I, I think there's a, a, a number of areas. There's the leadership, um, there's the hiring process, um, the retention process of the, the, the um, staffing that they currently have, and then there's the budgeting process as well. And so I, I would start by saying with leadership, um, having the opportunity for leadership to understand and embrace um, uh, diversity and um, equity inclusion and that and being able to understand the differences and that it's OK to have those differences. Um, I think a lot of um, agencies want to stray away from it because it's a hard subject. Um, but what it does is it it, it creates um, divisiveness in that as well. So being able to embrace it and know the differences and 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 be okay with the the fact that you have those differences um, on the leadership side is one thing. Then you know you talk about the hiring process um, and making sure that um, you know the hiring practices don't have any biases in it. And it, which gives others opportunities to be able to not only um, flourish as they're being hired, but it also gives though those uh, individuals um, who are seeking promotions opportunities um, at promotion without barriers and 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 um, without hiring barriers in that as well. And then um, when you talk about the um, retention piece is understanding and listening to the people who work under you, uh, people who work for you, and having conversations about uh, what their day-to-day -day work looks like, uh, what barriers they see in their day-to-day -day work. Um, it, it brings me to an example. Um, when I worked under the jail division of the county, um, they were hiring for a sergeant position. And there was this um, individual, BIPOC individual, he asked a question of uh, if, this job doesn't work out or if I don't, you know, work out in this position, do I have the ability to go back to being an officer? You know, and how that was taken for him or by the committee was that he wasn't capable of doing his job. Um, instead of looking at the fact that this guy enjoys what he does so much that he doesn't want to risk losing that job. Mm -hmm. And so he's sitting in front of a committee who doesn't doesn't understand um, his viewpoint. And so that's one of the things that, you know, um, come to mind when, when you do that, because here he is sitting in a position uh, for a job that there's no one that looks like him in any position above him. And so, you know, that's a legitimate question for him because he's never seen success from people who look like him in a position like that. And so I think, you know, being able to have representation on um, hiring committees uh, to be able to identify questions such as that or, or you know, where a person's coming from in that situation um, is, is a big thing. And then lastly, just the, the budgeting piece is to make sure that um, we're naming um, uh, equity and inclusion in our budgeting practices that we're setting aside monies um, to be able to uh, you know um, recruit um, and have training programs set up for our staffing so that's what i would offer a, a uh, an organization who's looking to hire thank right. you my brother thank you um, real quick Hire a deed or do a deep dive with the IDI. Understand your company. Everybody has a narrative, but data doesn't lie. The truth will be there. Number two, understand the subculture within your business and outside of your business. Who you are in community has a big difference and a big impact. Number three, build relationships with underserved com communities to build your future workforce. How do you show up to those communities that are underrepresented? When do you show up? All that has impact. Are you supporting the Little League baseball team in your community? Do they know who you are? And more importantly, do they know that you care? And the last one is our new employees are extremely savvy. I am so proud of this new generation of workers because they are doing their homework. 
And if they see your company isn't about them, they're not going to be about you. So we have some cleanup and some opportunities for great change. Thank you. Shayla, <clears throat> Shayla, you're on mute. Dang it. I was, well, was going to say that was a drop the mic moment. It, that it was, was. That's what after I was that. saying. I was like, I said we had some church moments over here. We had some claps <laughs> and everything going on. That's I know. <laughs> I was like, I you could hear a pin drop after that. Hey, to go, Carl. That was it. That's what we <laughs> needed. Okay. I don't even know, but that was, I don't even know if I should keep asking questions after that. That was great. Um, okay. So the next one is for Sonia and Tim. Um, have you noted any employee benefit programs which might assist in retracting, uh, <laughs> uh, attracting or retaining diverse talent? So specifically benefit programs, right? So um, something the companies have added. So when you were talking about having it in the budget, Tim, so um, something specifically, you know, a benefit program added. Um, have you noted anything specific that have benefited organizations? Well, I think St. Louis County has benefited by adding our BIPOC community, um, our, BIPOC, our BIPOC team, and, um, you know, offering a opportunity to hear a diverse group of people who um, often hadn't felt heard. Um, so I think that's a, a big piece, um, you know, and then you always have the, the um, the health benefit piece, the retirement benefit piece, um, you know, and but but most recent, you know, a lot of agencies, companies are going to remote work and that has been a good benefit for a lot of people to be able to have some, um, be able to do some remote work, to be able to have flexible scheduling, um, that type of thing, um, especially for people with families. Um, with other obligations in that. So I think that's a big piece in that as well. Absolutely. Sonia? Oh, you're on mute too. There you go. Thanks. I don't know if I can follow up Carl after all that, but I, but I will. <laughs> I'll try. Um, so for InTech, what we found through general feedback as well as um, some of our onboarding new hire surveys that we we try to do regularly, um, you know, just in general, 401k, paid holidays, opportunities for development advancement, probably the big three attractors um, specifically for our um, diverse groups. Um, we have increased some of our options from a benefit standpoint. Um, one thing I would say is, you know, as an example from the medical side, we always have had a high deductible HSA plan. Um, our, <clears throat> our company contributes a fair amount into the HSA for employees, but that comes with a certain type of premium, right? So we added a, another option, which um, reduces that HSA contribution, but also reduces the premium and still gives them good coverage. So that's been one thing that I think has helped is just having those options. But in all reality, to me, the most important thing about the benefits and the most important thing that we have found for our employees and especially those from a um, diverse group is giving them that opportunity to fully understand the programs. Um, as we all know, you know, some of these insurances and they're complicated for all of us. And so if you're someone um, who, you know, <laughs> English isn't your first language, you know, those kind of things that really can develop some barriers. So we have worked really hard to um, remove those barriers. So a couple of things that we have done is we um, have interpretation services available. So we do one on one orientations and we have a service now that we can do Zoom with them, do a call, what have you, and they can immediately interpret any of the things that we're, we are talking about when it comes to benefits with that new hire. Um, that's been really helpful. We have come a long way in having our benefit programs, um, packets, anything like that translated into the languages that we have within our plant. 
Um, as you know, that takes a lot of time, but we've really gone a long way with that. Intech also does on-site ESL training. And with that ESL training, we partnered with um, an educational organization to kind of custom customize the, um, the content within that ESL training. And part of it is to go through benefit terms and just insurance terms and, and things like that, um, as well as specific terms out on our manufacturing floor. Um, of course, we're a custom extruder. And so a lot of individuals aren't gonna know um, some of that extrusion technology and terminology. So between the benefits and those, those are some ways that we customized our ESL programs. And I think that's really um, been a benefit for our employees. Awesome. Um, so we only have a couple of minutes left, maybe enough for one more question. So this one's going to go to Leanne and Catrice. And I think this is a good way to end. So how can you miss equity if you're constantly striving for equality? How do you miss equity? All right, I'll keep it consistent and go first <laughs> on this last one. Um, I think as Carl mentioned earlier, you know, we know that um, equality and equity are fundamentally different. And in today's climate, we see a lot of emphasis placed on DE&I, and it's not an accident that the E stands for equity and not equality. Um, if we know that equity is providing people with what they need versus treating all people the same, then we have to really be intentional about investing in the resources. And I think Tim also mentioned this earlier, that employees need to be, it, we need to invest in the resources that employees need to be successful. Um, I think the missed opportunity is really, um, the missed opportunity for true equity, I think is really where I have seen um, businesses really kind of, or employers lumping equity and inclusion together. Um, and, um, you know, which places emphasis, I think, on showing employers or employees that they're valued and respected, um, but has a very low cost, right? So it is far easier, I think, to um, review safety policies or to post on equity statements on a website than to really look at a budget to see where we can financially prioritize training, mentoring, or even support services to reduce barriers for employees, such as transportation or childcare, which also was mentioned earlier, food, housing, um, which are some of the things that we see in our most disproportionately underserved individuals and communities in um, the workforce. Um, you know, I've also heard a lot of uh, heard a lot of employers hiring DEI managers, but not allocating any financial resources or budgets towards that work. And so it's not enough, right, to just hire a racial equity manager or a diversity officer and then leave them with no resources to do what they do for your organization to advance and grow. And so, um, you know, I would say that that coupled with the lack of investment, financial investment overall organizationally is really where some of the misses are. Thanks, Carl, for the thumbs up. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think like this whole conversation about like that we have this labor shortage and we have a we are looking for talent and organizations and businesses are in need of that you know of labor, and then we have this pool of untapped talent and skill sets and life experiences that can that can come in and become great employees and great parts of the company. And I think this question around equity and equality, it's around equality requires us to think about problem solving and understanding the historical context in some cases of why some um, community members have, they have stopped looking for work. And I think we have to ask the question, like why did, why did they stop? Like what are the frustrations or the challenges or the barriers that have stopped people from want, wanting to look? I, um, I have a family member who looked for two years straight for a job, even entry level, and has very dark skin. And I think that there's some things that we have to think through. How do we create welcoming environments? How is our hiring process welcoming? What are some of those other strategies that we might not have had to do before? Because there was more than enough workers. 
So I, I think that, you know, I've heard in this conversation that this is an opportunity and it, it really is an opportunity for our communities to become overall better. I think when we have more people employed, our, our poverty rate drops, we have more people earning income, just overall, it just makes sense for us to do these strategies. And the other thing is there's lots of resources and examples of how you can do this, be equitable. We have to start sharing information and doing this, viewing this as like a collective work and working together. So I would say um, one example of, of uh, something that I have seen work is that there was an employer who was looking to employ really targeted, um, wanted to work with um, indigenous employees. And so when they did their training program, they hired native trainers to do the program and they, they included a work on historic trauma. Now, until up to that point, I had never heard of a training, a job, a workforce development training program focused on historic trauma and under the, for the participants to understand what it is and to understand the impact on their own individual lives and how it impacts them at work. I think that those are the kind of strategies that we have to look at. And I think before, maybe we haven't um, needed to because we had so many workers, but we're in this place where we're in an incredible opportunity to really improve and refine our like hiring strategies and our retainment strategies. So I, I think I'll end with that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Leanne. Um, so we can put on the resources slide. I think this was an absolutely great presentation um, discussion. Thank all of our panelists for being here today. I mean, fantastic discussion. Congrats, I mean, applause, applause, yes, yes. Um, so there's the resources for everybody. The, the presentation was recorded and it'll be available um, afterwards and we'll make sure all the resources available for everyone as well. Um, so we have the LMI data tools, um, links to the Brooklyn Park, um, links to the resources, uh, us as the consultants. Next slide. Um, and then D training grants and career force partners. And then um, again, our next year's calendar. Uh, so then we have Adeshewa to tell you about next month's Workforce Wednesday. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, Adeshewa Adesiji, Workforce Strategy Consultant in the metro area. Um, I invite all of you to attend our next Workforce Wednesday webinar scheduled for February 1st, where we will be talking about biases, microaggressions, and code switching in the workplace. So what are those, what, what does biases and microaggressions, those effects have on workers and businesses? And also we'll dive into the phenomenon of code switching, what that is and how that affects both workers and businesses as well. We would like to thank all of you for joining us um, for the main session, and we'd like to you all to stick around for the unplugged session immediately following this one where you can unmute yourselves, um, turn on your cameras. So if you'd like to ask any one of our panelists um, directly any questions, um, feel free to do so. You can also type them in the chat. So this is where we can get comfortable, talk to each other, um, and just have um, open conversations. Um, if you re registered, we're also going to be sending you the recording and the resources from today's session. Um, and then feel free to reach out to us for any questions that you have. We're also going to put a survey in the chat um, and again, the links to our page. Um, but stick around for our unplug session. We're going to switch over to that now. So thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm.